One of the complaints that I have about this station is that it doesn't have a single scene with Laurie and Amy together. Yeah. The closest that we get to their relationship is the scene where Amy says to Joe, how would you feel if Laurie had feelings for another person? And Joe essentially gives her her blessing that Laurie can go and be with another woman. Then we get right to the end where Laurie is like, oh, yeah, Amy and I are married. Oh, okay. It is a shame because I have seen these promotional pictures with Elizabeth Taylor and Peter Lawford. They look so good together. And why didn't I get a scene with them? It's really sad. I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, there are quite a few of them. At least in the 1933, we get a one where Amy's morning bed. And then she's like, Lori, you came. And because he goes right to her and she runs into his arms. There is some of that at least. But not too many in the 1949 film. Sometimes I wonder if this was something that started another wave of people shipping Joe and Laurie, because in the end, right before Friedrich comes, there's this moment when Laurie is giving Joe this long loving look. Amy is standing right next to him, but he's looking at Joe, and then suddenly Friedrich comes and then it goes under the umbrella. That is really confusing. The same happens in the 2019 film, with Joe suddenly wanting Laurie back, which is not in the book. So we haven't moved on anywhere. It is such an awkward shot because we literally just come from the attic scene where he is like, Amy and I are so happy then going into that loving look of longing. I don't want to say total regret, but I can see why some people would think, oh, poor Amy, what ending she got. This version does not tell you everything about Amy and Laurie's progression that I think is a point taken away from the film. I wonder if it is the editor's fault or was it the script? I don't know. Then there is the scene where Laurie proposes to Joe and he's pretty angry, which is good because that is in the book. Right after he walks away, there's a scene that lasts for a second where Amy is looking after him. And you might miss it if you don't pay attention to it. It is a confusing narrative. Again, it is weird because pretty much you can do almost a side-by-side comparison with the 33 film. And it is almost exact. Thank you so much for sharing my love for Little Woman. All the transcriptions of the Little Woman podcast are now available as paperbacks, ebooks, and as audiobooks on Amazon. Kindle, Nook, and bookstores. You can find all the links from the description. And now, back to the show. Certain scenes are added, like their discussion with Laurie in the beginning. There is a little bit more, oh, he ran away and this and this, but I am surprised that certain scenes go out because it is not even long that one scene in Europe with Amy and Laurie reuniting, that is probably not more than 30 seconds a near minute why wasn't that minute so important to them it is so confusing this one is not a good uh, me and Lori film it is joe and friedrich friendly but not amy and Lori friendly you know i read elizabeth taylor's biography and i was very excited when i got into a little woman and it was only then she played sport amy in the 1949 little woman That was the only thing the book mentioned. And I'm like, this is not good. But to be fair, that book handled more about her marriages than her acting career. I was going to say, unfortunately, her private life did overshadow her career quite a bit. Elizabeth Taylor was an amazing actress. I think she did this part really well between her acting in the script. Joe and her younger Amy, we see her being a little snobbish, childish type of girl. But when we get to see her later, we see that she is very mature and fully adult. I think she did that pretty well, if I remember correctly. I think she pretty much jumped from being a child actress to being an adult actress. I want to say that when she was 15, she worked on a movie. 
where her co-star was like 10 years older than her and they were acting as a married couple of the same age. She just looked very mature. When I looked at her, I would have thought her to be at least 20, but no, she was 15. This was probably one of the rare films where she got to play the natural progression of her age from teenager to adult in terms of how she portrayed the character rather than just being a full-on adult. She managed to do it well. I do like that scene when Aunt March and Amy go to New York to meet Joe, and then they tell Joe that they are going to Europe, and then Amy feels really bad that Joe did not get the trip. That is somewhat closer to the books. It is not like in some other adaptations where Amy is like, why nobody can be happy for me? I think this is one of those ones where it didn't feel like they were constantly pitting Joe and Amy against each other. I do feel like some versions really push that, and this one takes a better progression. We see them butting heads because Amy is complaining about the play, and Joe is trying to tell her no. But now that they are adults, they actually talk to each other, and it is very clear that they do love each other. They just are sisters and sisters just get on each other's nerves sometimes. I think it is important that you see that. It is not like the other one is more mature than the other. They grow at the same pace. A lot of times people are like, Joe stayed as a child while Amy grew, or Amy stayed as a child while Joe became an adult, when they both grow as people in the novel. Margaret O'Brien is probably one of my top three favorite Beths. I think she did a wonderful job. I really like her relationship with older Mr. Lawrence in this movie. It is very moving. Two scenes that really stand out to me. The first one is when she comes home from the Hummels and her standing there. You can feel that the death of that baby really affected her. She is just standing there almost stunned. I always remember that scene because I'm just like, how do you process that? It really did feel like poor Beth. It is very sensitive. The baby died in my arms, and now I am sick. I think it really showed that, Beth, you had a lot of trauma going on there. Uh, Somebody else would have totally broken down, but you are a lot stronger emotionally than, than I think people give you credit for. Physically, obviously, we know she is very weak, but emotionally, spiritually, she was definitely very strong. And then the other moment is her scene with Joe saying, I know I am dying, but I can accept that. I need... I need you to accept it too. I always get teary eyed when I watch it because it is so emotional. Because when I look at them, it's like, look at this little girl comforting her older sister. It is okay, Joe. I am going to die, but you have so much life to live. I think a lot of the modern feminist narrative about Beth is one-sided and very offensive to her character. If you are 15 and you see a child dying literally in your arms, it doesn't matter if it was the 1850s or 2024, that is going to traumatize you a lot. Especially if you have never been in a situation where death has been prominent. They were fairly young when Aunt March's husband passed away. I don't think they were that acquainted with the idea compared to a few other people. The idea of a baby dying, a life that could have lived for so much more and dying in your arms. At some point in the book, Beth says, I felt the baby grow cold for some people that I will never forget that feeling. It is not just like, oh, you were cold because you stayed under weather. You were cold because there is no life. That is a lot to process. Later on that day, oh, yeah, scarlet fever. I could be dying next even though she wasn't physically strong. People are like, oh yeah, she is just there to give sympathy to the characters. She has to deal with that all on her own. The second time she realized that she was really sick and going to die. That is a lot, a lot more baggage than I think people want to give her. They're like, no, she is just the martyr sister and she's there to die. No. Absolutely. It always makes me angry. When I read stuff like that, because then it is like, you completely miss the point. Maybe they don't read the book. I think that is the case. Aunt March in this movie is hilarious. She cracks me up. I did like the other Aunt March. 
but this one really did crack me up because she is a very good grudge. Old lady, but humorous type. Lucille Watson. Very demanding presence. I was just thinking of that scene where she comes in to give Marmee the money and you can see Amy just shrinks away. Just her presence is enough for you to feel like, oh no. Then there is the moment when John comes to tell Meg that he is in love with her, but Aunt Marge settles the question. I watched this movie first time maybe five years ago. I was really surprised by that scene because I remember that it was in the book, but I hadn't seen that in any other adaptations except this one and the 1933 one, and it was a nice thing to see. John actually forgets his umbrella to the marches, so it is a bit like Friedrich with the umbrella. Then he comes back for it, and then he hears Meg defending him to Aunt March. It is so cute. I need to mention that in the 33 one, I really like the little scene between them, because I think in the 33 one, when John comes, he is like, I came to get my umbrella. I also wanted to see how you are, and to talk with your dad. Meg goes, oh, he is in the rack. I mean, your umbrella is quite well. He messes things up because she is is so nervous. That he's so cute. Yes, they are really cute. I like to see their own little moments when they are walking together and the conservatory scene. Oh, I am so sorry that you don't have any family to worry about but we will, and John is like, would you, and he is looking her to her eyes. There are quite a few moments. There are a lot more moments between John and Meg in those movies than I remembered. That is definitely a plus. Overall, if you had to place the 49-1, where would you put it? And again, we can we can shift movies too if we feel like it. I think it is going to be my third one now third one and you put 33 uh number two yeah i am thinking the same thing too again as the funny it is that the scripts are pretty much the same they managed to switch it up a bit i don't know if you remember this but in the 1949 film there's the moment when the maid in new york says oh professor he's from germany and he teaches languages but why do they need to learn languages and they all live right here. Oh, yeah. She wasn't that active. I remember that because as soon as Friedrich came in, she became alive. She is dragging Joe along and Joe is trying to talk to her and she is like, aha. And then as soon as Friedrich comes in, she is all chattery. I do remember that. That actress has a great voice. I think it adds to the funniness. Her voice is like a higher pitch New Yorker. It is funny compared to her visual appearance, just being like, hey, another day, another hour closer to death. <laughs> that is a good moment. It is also nice in the film when Joe is in New York, you do get this feeling that Friedrich is looking after her. He's taking her to different places. He takes her to the zoo, to the circus, and to the opera. You get this feeling that when Joe lived in Concord, he didn't have that many places where she could go. When she is in New York, Friedrich is this cultivated guide for her who shows her the world. I like that. When she is like, oh, I think I want to be a singer, and he says before you wanted to be a tightrope walker, he is more amused and not she like, did. just pick one. He is enthralled by her enthusiasm about the world. I did like that. You do get the sense that he's really amazed by her or that he has this deep crush on her. When I was watching these other Rosano Brassi films, he's very attentive with the female actresses. Maybe it was just the actor's personality, but in this case it really works, because that is how Frederick is in the book with Joe. It just melts my heart. He just understood exactly what the character was. He was like, oh, this guy is in love with this woman and is romantic. Well, I can do that. That is the way Friedrich is. He's supposed to be in love with Joe, but not show that directly to her when they are in New York. And respectful He's very around careful. her, which is opposite to Laurie. 
I remember in the 49 one because it switches around the scenes of Joe and Friedrich from the 33 film where they had the discussion about her writing before they go to the opera. Whereas in the 49 one, that discussion happens after. When he tries to tell her how he feels, I just feel it because it feels like he is finally ready to say something, but then it's like, oh no. And then when you get to the end of him coming to the house and he hears Lori's name, uh, Joe is calling for Lori. He thinks that they are together uh, with much grace and dignity he gives Joe the book and essentially thinks I'm too late. But I want her to be happy. Again, that is a strong opposite to Lori's reaction. But this one definitely made me go, oh, poor Friedrich. But then I'm, I was like, good, he loves Joe and they can actually be together. That is a great scene with Under the Umbrella. I think this one is one of the top versions of Joe and Friedrich. If you are really there just for Joe and Friedrich, this film will give you that. No wonder I fell in love with this film when I saw it for the first time. It is not the only reason why I like this version, but it does play a big part. That was the discussion between Christina and myself. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you next time. Take care and make good choices. Bye.